Hello and welcome to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Vivian Allred, naturopathic nutritional therapist and hormone enthusiast. If you want to learn how to rebalance your female hormones, regulate your menstrual cycle and reclaim your vitality, then you are in the right place. Each week I will be delving into different conditions such as PCOS, endometriosis, infertility, hypothyroidism, acne and hair loss. Stay tuned for interviews with expert guests, Q&As and solo episodes that are all intended to help you move from hormonal chaos to hormonal harmony. If you'd like to submit a question for me to answer on the podcast, then you can email them to hormonesinharmony at gmail.com. The information shared on this podcast is intended for educational purposes only and is not designed to replace the advice of your health practitioner. That said, let's get into today's episode. Hi everyone, this is episode number three of the podcast and today I'm delighted to welcome my friend Rosie to the podcast. Rosie Tadman is a naturopathic nutritional therapist who studied at the prestigious College of Naturopathic Medicine in London. Rosie uses modern science plus traditional wisdom in order to get women in hormonal flow and to support couples trying to conceive. She supports underlying causes rather than just suppressing symptoms. Rosie works both from her home clinic in Charlton, Manchester and also offers online consultations. So hi Rosie and welcome to the Hormones and Harmony podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to our interview today. We're going to take like a deep dive into fertility and just cover all the basics because I know that this is a real big passion of yours. So I want to first start off with you just going into who you are, what you do and how you got into this area of fertility. So I am Rosie and I suppose my history is, so I used to be work within corporate human resources. So I originally did a business degree and then went on a human resources graduate scheme. And when people kind of asked me like, do you love your job? I was like, mm, I don't, I don't, I'm indifferent about it. But the thought of kind of being in that career forever was like horrible. I was like, oh my God, it's fine for now, but there's only so many people you can sack, so many redundancies you can make. And then you get to a point when you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I remember seeing um, an advert on Facebook from Patrick Holford about, because uh, I was living in London at the time, and it was about uh, learning about food as medicine. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I was, because I hadn't really thought of food as medicine for me it was kind of always a if you're at a healthy weight and you're managing your weight you kind of must be pretty healthy like literally that is how basic yeah. it was I think that's common for most people to be honest yeah which yeah. now is like mental uh, yeah <laughs> I used to think like that and that other people do but like that was me like that's yeah. how I thought about things Same. and I was a healthy weight and I kind of but I was I was interested so I went along and I saw I actually took my dad along with me because he was down in London at that weekend um, and I remember saying to my dad after the talk from Patrick Holford, I was like, I'm going to retrain and I'm going to be a nutritional therapist. And literally two weeks later, I handed in my notice, which was quite a big shock, I think, to my manager. Because I was on this graduate scheme that was kind of, I suppose, setting you up to be this human resources leader and um, was kind of seen as an amazing opportunity to have, which it would have been if that's kind of the area that I wanted to go into. And then, uh, yeah, started to work. I still stayed within HR for the first two years of my studies, but I got a job working in a charity and I went part-time, which just wouldn't have been viable working in, um, in the corporate job that I was in. And it really helped me. So I suppose kind of from a personal perspective is I lived in Ghana for a summer during university. And when I came back, I had IBS and went to the doctors kind of couldn't really figure out what it was I started to have really bad skin that I'd never had in my teens like you know I'd escaped teen years with no acne and all of a sudden I had bloody acne and I was like what the hell where's this IBS and acne come from they couldn't really figure it out and it was only when I started to study and kind of look at my own health from that holistic perspective that I realized hey I had parasites delightful parasites i've had them as well oh, have you? <laughs> we have that in common. Yes. Yes. <laughs> i had yeah. two 
<laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. What were yours? Um, what, what sisters Hominus mm-hmm. and Dienes Amoeba Fraudulus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the not the kind of resistant to treatment ones. Yeah, yeah. I had an overgrowth of Blastocystis, yep. which I recently had a stool test done, and they're at like very rare. Oh, so, and, and no symptoms good. which is kind of the thing for me so I was like hooray um so yeah so I suppose those that, that was the area that that those were the reasons sorry that originally sparked my interest and I suppose the reason for fertility in particular is I mean I just think it's amazing that the raw building blocks of what we eat drink and how we think can affect fertility um and I think for me, like I love the science behind everything, but also within the area of fertility, there's definitely this additional area of being fertile that actually means not listening to what your brain's thinking, but just letting your body take over and do its thing, which for me being someone that is kind of very driven, Mm -hmm. it almost teaches me an important lesson. And yeah. reminds me constantly that in actual fact to be that fertile, abundant individual, whether it's for trying for a baby or not, is really important. Yeah, and I yeah. just love it. I think it's amazing. Good. When I get those little scans in, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, but it's just the best feeling ever. And yeah, yeah, I definitely agree that when we're telling clients about different things like stress management techniques, it constantly reminds you to practice what you preach. I think we met at the gestational journey. Mm, that was the first yeah. time, isn't it? Yeah. When we were and, fang- yes. <laughs> yeah. we were like, oh my God, it's fangirling. Oh. The Beyonce of the nutrition world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I think we had some mutual friends and I think we just kind of clicked. We've got similar things, interests, and turns out we live like pretty close to each other as well. The first question I want to ask you is you were mentioning about fertility and pregnancy and how you help people through maybe the IVF or natural route that they go down. But for the young women who are not looking for that at the moment, they're not wanting to get pregnant. Why should they care about the hormones and fertility? Why is it important to still want to be fertile when we're in, say, our 20s and 30s and not looking for a child just yet? First of all, I'd say I have seen a massive shift in people in their 20s and 30s who don't want a baby now necessarily but do want to balance their hormones which I think is amazing that that mindset is out there and not even within the little bubble that we work within it is spreading it's got a far bigger reach now but why should people care so I'd say first of all so first of all I'd say people don't care that's fine so I've got friends or I've had people that have called me when maybe you know they're saying that they're training for a marathon or they want to do a triathlon and kind of help them and I'm like hell no like that's like (laughs) the opposite like to get a good time in a marathon (laughs) is basically the opposite of how I work yes it goes out the window complete goes out the window your course all goes out the window Mm -hmm. like fitness and health are two different things yeah and so I suppose like if someone's like well that's I want to do 10 marathons in two years that's my goal fantastic go for it I suppose acknowledge that potentially that might put your hormones and your fertility at risk but hey you know some people want to live in the fast lane and some people want to go out and on a Saturday night and a Friday night and take loads of drugs and hey like who am I to judge do whatever Mm -hmm. makes you happy however if you do want to manage your hormones now for your later fertility I would I suppose I've seen so many instances of ladies where when they have then wanted to try for a baby and potentially they've been on the pill for years that it's only at that point they've realized they've got something more deep-rooted going on in their body whether that's polycystic ovaries whether it's endometriosis whether in actual fact they've got no periods maybe they've got hypothalamic amenorrhea like there's so many different things that could go on and this is not to kind of scaremonger because I often feel like it's almost like it's it can be quite fearful if you know like you should care about this because maybe in 10 years when you try for a baby you'll realize you've got problems and I don't think it needs to necessarily be the case because I think there are some key things that you can keep an eye on to see whether you have potentially got more more other underlying things that are going on 
And what would you say are some of the main signs and symptoms or indicators of hormonal imbalance for people who don't know what hormones are? They don't know what they're looking for. Is it just the period that indicates it? Or are there other things that could be going on in the body that could indicate either high hormones or if they need more hormones? Just can they clear that up for someone who's not quite sure? So I'd agree with you that the, the biggest indicator of hormonal health is a period. That's the biggest, I suppose, like outward indicator of hormonal health is your period. And if you're on the pill, that's as we know, but not everyone does. You know, if you're on the pill, that bleed in between isn't a period. It's just a synthetic bleed. So that's not a good indicator. But if you're not on the pill or you're not on um, any sort of hormonal birth control, then your period is a brilliant indicator. Period shouldn't be painful, as we know. But again, that's something that, you know, wind back seven years I thought a painful period was normal yeah. and I think a lot of women still do and um, just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal and exactly it's kind of drilled into society that we that's what a period is we we should all yeah. suffer that it's like a curse so mm. that definitely it is changing people are coming to understand that that's not the case but it is taking time and this is one of the reasons I want to do the podcast just to yeah. educate women and just let them know I'm not against birth control in any way, but I just want people to know what they're getting themselves into and the possible side effects, not just the stroke and blood clots that the doctor might mention, but the other things, the hair loss, the loss of libido, the fatigue and nutrient deficiencies. I think they commonly happen, but people don't know why and they don't associate it with the pill that they're taking. Yeah, definitely. And I would say like, Other signs that I often hear women talk about in clinic, but maybe you wouldn't hear outside of that setting is women talking about complete, and this would probably go more like to your deficiency states, um, but would be loss of libido. And I think like there is an epidemic of like people not wanting to have sex because they Mm -hmm. just don't feel that they want to. Yeah. Yeah. And just don't feel they haven't got that desire. When it, comes, yeah, when it comes to the pill as well people are taking it because they want to have um, mm. unprotected sex they want to mm. um, prevent pregnancy they don't want a child yet they want freedom but when they start this pill they lose the sex drive anyway so it's kind of mm. ridiculous to think of definitely and I think even even down to like non-hormonal birth control like the copper coil you know like I hear clients say Oh, ever since they've had the copper coil, they've had thrush or they've got bacterial vaginosis. And it's like, well, that's the best contraception you could have yeah. is just get yourself chronic thrush. Yeah, and then <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that's another option. And also, I'd say for on the deficiency side, another common thing that you don't really hear about is lack of cervical mucus. So not having what they often team that egg white cervical mucus which thinking back to my earlier 20s when I can remember having a lot more of it than I do now and being like grossed out by it and mm-hmm. now I definitely have much less than I did even in my earlier 20s and I'm like oh like if I had that much now I would love that amount of cervical mucus yeah um so yeah cervical mucus and some people don't get it I know and I think that's still maybe a taboo subject people don't actually know what it is and what it indicates so do you just want to go over what we should be looking for and maybe the signs of fertility during the cycle so how do you know when you're ovulating is there any body senses that you can be looking out for during the month and yeah how cervical mucus kind of works and how it changes throughout the month as well yeah so first of all to track your cycle The best way to do that is through tracking your temperature because from the point of ovulation to your next period, your temperature should rise by 0.5 Celsius. So that's the sign that you have ovulated. And the simple reason that once you've ovulated and that egg's left the sac, that sac then makes progesterone. And that progesterone is a hot hormone, so it raises your body temperature. So I'd say for... And although like the period gets the limelight because that's what you see every month or hopefully you see every month, in actual fact, the star of the show is ovulation for sure. Yeah. And the only, re- only way of knowing that's going on definitively 100% is through temperature. 
Um, so I'd say you could do something, I mean, I know the kind of famous one that you often hear about is natural cycles. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that a lot of my clients use. Or if you have got polycystic ovaries, then Obvisense is the, the one that I often recommend to clients. The reason you can't use natural cycles if you have got PCOS is because you might get false negatives in terms of ovulation from doing peripheral temperature. You need that core body temperature. So yeah, I'd say temperature is the best way to start to learn about your body. And really interesting things can come up from that alone. Then you can add in to lots of these apps or just write in your phone or on a bit of paper, then what other signs you see. I, and start writing down what your cervical mucus starts to look like throughout the month. But essentially, just before ovulation, you should ideally get mucus that looks like egg white, quite literally like egg white. Not everyone gets that, and it doesn't mean that you haven't ovulated. Some women will get just wetness, or even just when you wipe yourself, you will get almost like a bit of a shinier mucus on mm -hmm. there. So it won't be sticky. Yeah. It will look more shiny. Um, so that's what I'd say to look out for. But just track those things. Because if you have got things like low estrogen, as that improves, a great bodily sign is the amount of cervical mucus that you make will also increase. Definitely. And yeah, me personally, awesome. yeah, I track using the Daisy Fertility Monitor. I think that's another really good option. Uh, but after speaking, so that's the to, one that you put in your yeah, your map. Yeah, and it comes yeah. with its own monitor. Yeah, so it does. It's like a computer basically, and it's used in I think it's somewhere like Germany as mm. you can use it as um, like contraceptives. It's commonly used mm. over there. So yeah, and you can plug it into your well. phone. Yeah, um, but after speaking to um, I think Angela, she mm. posted about the obvious sense, and mm. I was kind of talking to her about that and. I feel like that would be more suitable for me because of I've got PCOS. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Um, looking back, I probably would have tried that, but the days is working well for me, and I'm enjoying using that. But yeah, she explained that it's m much more sensitive and effective yeah. for women with PCOS. So that's just important for anyone who's out there who's looking for maybe a fertility monitor if you've got PCOS. Um, how much is Daisy? How much uh, is the Daisy I think it was two hundred and fifty. I think. Oh, so it's more expensive than obviously. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, okay. but I heard much more research. I hadn't really heard of Obviousense before and I'd heard a lot of people talking about the daisy and the benefits. So I kind of just went with that and then yeah. um, started to learn about Obviousense and yeah, something I'll definitely look into as well. It is a good one. It is a really good one. And for fertility tracking and the cervical mucus and fertility awareness method, I would definitely recommend the book Taking Charge of Your Fertility. Have you read that one before? Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. like the Bible of fertility the awareness. One. Yes. <laughs> it is a chunky number, yes, it is. that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah take a while to get through. <laughs> yeah, I'll read that when I've got a year off. So. No, yeah, I've got it, nice... and I do. It's a good one. There's some nice diagrams in there as well. <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah, so um, that's a really good option for people to maybe do some more research into and learn a lot more about the fertility awareness method. Yeah. So when it comes to fertility, do you believe that infertility rates are on the rise or do you think that we're just talking more about it and maybe being able to find out more about it in recent years? So what are your thoughts? I think unquestionably, if we use sperm parameters to see whether or not fertility is improving or not, then it is definitively decreasing. Because we, can, we know that sperm is on the decrease, and that's from the amount as well as the motility and also the morphology or the shape as well. You know, it is drastically reduced over the past 20 to 30 years. And I always say like sperm is like the canary in the coal mine. Like they're the first thing that are going to be affected in a man because they're so small and they're so sensitive that as soon as they become affected, it's not far behind, everything else will become affected. So I think it is definitely, it is almost like 
and again this isn't like scaremongering but it is scary <laughs> it is like the start of the real handmaiden's tale it's like oh my god this is coming to life like and we only need to look at sperm levels to see like how yeah yeah and what do you think are the, the major factors and contributing drivers to this decrease rates of fertility in both men and women is it just food is it the food that we're eating is it our environment i'd say 100 percent multifactorial down to simple not necessarily easy things to change but stress is definitely in there i think the lack of soil quality therefore means that even if you are getting your five or your seven vegetables a day in actual fact, the nutrient density of those vegetables are arguably much lower anyway, just because we get all of the minerals from our vegetables and fruits through the soil. And we know we're over farming. Um, we're not necessarily doing crop rotation as we would have done 50, 60 years ago. I think also the rise in plastics. And I think 2018 has definitely been the year of like plastic awareness. <laughs> um predominantly i think from an environmental perspective which is amazing and i think the it's almost it's 2019 will hopefully be the continuing awareness of that but also the impact of that on our health as well so i think plastics is huge um and also i think even down to things like i suppose the things that are outside of my scope but are still worth mentioning are things like people just not seeing the daylight and we know like daylight sets our hormonal rhythm and that circadian rhythm is so integral. Um, so I think that is something that is, is really affecting both men and women. But from a nutritional perspective, I think definitely the lack of nutrient density in our food. I think we've become fat phobic, which is hugely detrimental, especially to female hormonal health and the fear around cholesterol, which we know our steroid hormones are built on a foundation of cholesterol so without eating that cholesterol which although we make 75 percent of it ourselves roughly we need to eat that other 25 percent to get our hormones up to those optimum levels um, so i think yeah from a nutritional perspective they're definitely key and i mean i'm gonna see weight watch and swimming world but... <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not. But, I mean, I feel like any people are like, oh, shouldn't name names. But it's like, well, why are they demonizing fat? Like so many yeah. people go to these, these slimming clubs. And I have so many clients who have been to those slimming clubs yeah, and have got same. massive relationship issues with food and their relationship with food is completely warped. And I do think, and you know, people are like, oh, I don't say anything because I don't want people to sue me. But it's like, well, firstly, I don't think you can sue someone for having an opinion. Mm -hmm. And my opinion is from what I've seen is the people running those clubs have got issues with food themselves. They're overweight themselves. Even if you've lost five stone, you know, if your BMI is still over 30, you're still overweight. And I think talking about food in terms of sins, the only thing that's sinful about that is the way that you talk about food. Yeah, totally agree with that. And yeah, there's people some of my clients or people I used to work with who were all in Slimming World and they're yeah. just like obsessed with it and they'd get the shopping at the end of the day and they'd have either some chocolate bars, some little snack bars, the Slimming World yeah. brand or um, a six pack of Strong Bowl Cider. But when I spoke to them about eating healthy fats like nuts and seeds, avocados, they, they yeah. couldn't eat that because it would just... Isn't them avocado a sin? Yeah, it would send them, it would be too many sins for the day. So they'd yeah. just stick with the cider or the Slimming World 100 calorie uh, snack pack. So, yeah, I definitely agree that that's not the way to go. And, yeah. and even the government, I mean, they are promoting a low fat diet as well. Yeah, still. Like, uh, I mean, so, and it's, and I mean, people come to me and they're angry because they're like, well, why is the government, they're lying to us. And I'm like, well, the government is. It's a big organisation to get change through something as big as that. It's unfortunately going to take time. I think there is a bit of saving face of, oh crap, like we've been saying this for so long. Maybe if we gradually wean it out and we introduce the Mediterranean diet as a good mm -hmm. interim, 
then no one will notice. And it's like, mm, I think people have noticed that you're cu- trying to cover your tracks badly. Yeah, um, I think they even did that with cholesterol. I think a couple of years ago, um, well, decades, for decades now, it's been to avoid dietary cholesterol because it clogs our arteries and causes heart disease. And then I think it was Dr. Mark Hyman who actually went through the um, latest dietary reports and they actually listed that cholesterol was no longer a nutrient of concern and mm. they didn't make that a big thing they just kind of slid it in there and just like changed the guidelines without actually reporting it because that would ma- mean mm. that everything they've been telling us for the past few decades hasn't been true and mm. again I can feel like there's going to be more things coming out in the future um, maybe with the grain intake that they're promoting and the dairy industry that they're going to be changing them but it's hard for them to just completely go back on what they've been telling us for all these years mm. yeah which is sad and I mean potentially they've got bigger fish to fry like Brexit yeah to worry. <laughs> Wait, that's I another mean, episode <laughs> yeah that is that is not what we're talking about yeah, yeah. we'll not go on a tangent on that one yeah um, so are there any particular foods to increase more of or avoid completely when it comes to fertility? So say there's someone who's been struggling with infertility or struggling with even hormone imbalances. Are there any just general foods that you would tell pretty much anyone to avoid and also increase? I would say like broad principles that would apply to 90% of the population would be firstly move to organic food where possible uh, because the amount of toxins that you can get from herbicides and pesticides they are hormone disruptors in themselves so if you can cut that out fantastic and in actual fact you could get two of the same meal so say if you had two of your classic sunday roast for instance if one of your sunday roasts was with organic vegetables and proper organic meat versus shitty meat with all the hormones and vegetables that weren't organic with all the pesticides and herbicides okay on paper you've got the same meal but in actual fact there your body receives those meals in completely different ways because one's got hugely laden with toxins and the others the other meal isn't so i think it's more of a quality discussion like we need to talk about food quality and where it comes from So that would be across the board. The The next one would be vegetables, seasonal vegetables, great. Um, I think one of the few things nutritional therapists agree on Mm -hmm. is we need to eat more vegetables, eat the rainbow. Except for the carnivore diet, Mm -hmm. that's just meat. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, Yeah, and even because I do recommend keto to some clients and I do really like the Diet Doctor website for resources but one of the things I strongly disagree with on the diet docs website is um even vegetable restriction because of the net carbs which I'm like come on now like I don't I don't buy that I don't think the science weighs up for actually restricting your vegetables as a way to cut your carbs I think you can the net carbs in above ground vegetables is so minimal that I've never seen it kick someone out of ketosis in any way Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah I think those above ground veggies are great try not to snack I think is a is a really good message to get out there and try and eat bigger meals so I know like the world the world of fasting should be fast is that good is that bad but let's not forget that three solid meals a day is actually a very gentle way to fast because in between those meals, your body's then going to be able to start to recognize how it needs to utilize its own fat stores for energy rather than relying on external food that's brought in. So I think that is something that I've nev- I never give. No, I lie. I occasionally give. But I always try as a best case scenario, say don't snack. So I never give like healthy snack ideas. Because I think that we need to get into bigger meals and then giving our body a rest in between. Um, whereas I see so many ladies who graze when I'm like, so what do you have for lunch and dinner? And they're like, oh, well, I just, you know, I pick, I might be hummus at work. And, hummus yeah, and carrot crackers, stick. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, no, <laughs> that's, not, that's not a meal. 
And I think as soon as you explain that in actual fact, in between when your body starts to get into that fasted state, that's actually the only time your body can utilize its own fat stores and you might even lose weight, all of a sudden people are willing to try it. So I'd say again, that's something universal. And I do like fasting in more like condensed hours and things like that, but that would only be for someone where their cortisol and their stress levels are under control. Because if they're not, then your body's in that fight and flight, then it can just, your liver will be giving off so much glucose, you won't be able to utilize your own fat stores anyway. But I think three meals a day is a good introduction for anyone to start and making sure you're having enough fat, protein and fiber with all of those meals. And other simple things would be sit down. It's like boring things to even mention and people like yawn when you say it, but it's so true. But just sit down and eat and that kind of mindful eating, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, I'm, I'm bored of hearing it, let alone saying it, but it is, it, I think it, there is, there's definitely something in it. And enjoy your food. I think, yeah, enjoying your food is really important. And one of the questions I always ask my clients is, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? So, I mean, I, there's definitely a part of me that lives to eat. Like I love food. But I completely recognize and I have clients who are like, I'm not that bothered, really. And then that might be when I go more down the, well, can you actually have a big smoothie for breakfast or for lunch or for dinner? And it's literally will take you two minutes to have. I'm not going to say it's going to be the tastiest thing in the world. But for those more functional eaters out there, Mm -hmm. they love that. Yeah. Because they're like, that's great. Whereas for me, I'd be like, what a waste of a breakfast. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) so i think it's kind of working out where you sit on that spectrum yeah definitely some people just are just eating for the fuel and if you tell them it's providing you with this protein this fat this fiber with these nutrients then they're just like yeah whatever i'll I'll just have it whatever it tastes like but yeah the other people you need to find a diet that they're going to enjoy for them to actually do it yeah. And just touching back on the fasting as well, I definitely agree with more of the fasting between meals rather than the long 18, 16 hour fasts overnight mm-hmm. or skipping breakfast completely because mm-hmm. a lot of that research has been done on men and yeah. women aren't just small men. We're completely mm-hmm. different. We have a 28, well, a monthly cycle, whereas men are on a 24 hour daily cycle and mm-hmm. they don't have the hormones to deal with they don't have to build up a uterine lining and expel it every month so i think the all of this hype online about fasting and maybe keto and going really low carb and bulletproof coffee all of these things uh, they've been tested on men and it's the men who are the ones who are showing the amazing results whereas women it can definitely lead to disordered eating to adrenal problems thyroid problems but again, it can be beneficial short term. So yeah. some time restricted feeding and a ketogenic diet for someone who's severely insulin resistant with PCOS, that could be a great thing. But again, I think it's about finding the root causes of the PCOS. And once she's back in balance and her hormones are functioning again, she may not need to stay on that for much more longer or she can do it cyclically and just do every couple of weeks a low carb diet. But yeah, I think that's really important to take the information that you see online and especially social media. There's a lot of people promoting different diets and detoxes and yeah. cleanses and workouts where because it works for a male or for one particular person, mm-hmm. you can't just take that advice and implement it on yourself because it doesn't take into account whether you've got IBS or digestive issues or mm-hmm gallbladder problems when it comes to the keto diet that's not going to work for you so are there any foods that you just say to avoid completely say like gluten is that just a no-no or do you find it to be different with every woman so first of all like never have it unless you're celiac say with gluten i suppose i my approach i'm not a purist like if you want to go and see a purist I wouldn't say come and see me. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say never have, so I don't even say like never have sugar or never have gluten is because I think it's then that fear of like, oh, what if I do accidentally have a bit of sugar or a bit of gluten? Um, However, things like gluten, I would say try and reduce, definitely. Try and reduce sugar 
where possible. And that includes like your health food sugars as well. So I think things like coconut sugar, like, mm -hmm. I mean, you could, I could bathe in a garden. Dates and, yeah, Dates garbage, yeah. and all of these sorts of things. Like they're, they're just sugar with extra vitamins. Like let's not pretend they're anything but. So in actual fact, if it was, should I have a teaspoon of sugar in my tea or a handful of dates, I would actually say go for that teaspoon of sugar, which I know is like, a lot of people would be like, are you mad? Yeah. But it's a whole food. But in terms of your insulin response, especially if you are, you have got insulin sensitive PCOS or you are insulin sensitive full stop, like your, your pancreas doesn't know that that 50 grams worth of carbohydrates come from dates was from dates and therefore a whole food and therefore you should process it better than that five grams of carbohydrates that's come from that teaspoon of sugar. Um, so I think sometimes in, and this, I suppose this is kind of talking to more the just because it's natural, it doesn't mean that it's not going to potentially have negative effects on your body. Just be yeah. mindful of that. Sugar so is what, sugar when it's when it's in the bloodstream, yeah. whether it's from like you say a fruit or vegetable or not. And yeah. when it comes to fruit as well, there's a lot of people. I got a bit of backlash the other week on social media because I was saying if you have PCOS and insulin resistance, it's good to limit the amount of fruit that you eat. Mm. And there was one girl saying that fruit should be just unlimited in the diet. We should be able to eat it if we want it. But I had to explain that I was discussing the population of PCOS, the insulin resistant type as well. Maybe for the adrenal type of PCOS, fruit's going to be more suitable. Mm. But although the fruit's got the vitamins, the fiber and the nutrients in there, it's mm. still going to affect the blood sugar and the insulin response regardless of it, if it's a plant or if it's a donut. It's going to have 100%. a similar response in the body. And especially, because I didn't say this at the beginning, but like before I moved into fertility, I actually worked for the NHS with people that were pre-diabetic. So like carbs and like amount of carbs and things was like, I was like Rain Man when it came to like carbs and things. <laughs> like banana and I'd be like, oh. um, but like I remember saying like the amount of carbohydrates in a standard medium banana is about the equivalent of two to three slices of bread. Like your insulin response is the same. Yeah. Arguably, and I know they're doing loads of research on well, people from an African contingent their blood glucose doesn't raise as highly as someone who's caucasian yeah potentially there's kind of more hereditary aspects that we also need to play into it like i know it's, it is more complicated than that but in the broad carbs are carbs and your insulin response is going to be the same but i would agree like a couple of a couple of pieces of fruit is great and the vitamins and, and i think diana at our gestational journey summit was kind of she was talking to the backlash of like, never have fruit brigade. Yeah. And I think, yeah, like one to two pieces of fruit is put the, the benefits of that are going to outweigh any negatives in terms of um, blood sugar balance and insulin. But any more than that, then potentially you are going to tip into it's actually not that beneficial. So I think then some, it comes down to dosage, I'd say. Yeah, definitely. She was promoting the use of the fruit therapeutically as well so yeah. the different pigments and the antioxidants for different benefits and she was also talking about having it after your meal not just on an empty stomach having yeah. a big load of fruit juice having it a, a small like 250 mils of pomegranate yeah. juice after your meal so that the fiber slows down the um uptake of glucose as well yeah. so i think that's a big factor as well people eating fruit alongside other things as well to kind of slow the glycemic release and yeah, not, it's not a great snack no definitely not and <laughs> with the five a day as well although we know it's gone up to 10 a day the fruit and veg intake it, you want most of that to be from vegetables so people mm -hmm. people are snacking on melon and strawberries and grapes and then they're thinking that they're getting the five a day but it should be the vegetables that are the majority of that intake just because yeah, they're the real superfoods yeah definitely yeah it should be we you probably have the same thing of 10 a day eight veggies two fruits and that's the yeah. optimal ratio and similarly when you maybe order a green juice or a smoothie you want to check if you buy if you buy it from a store or a 
the juice bar, you want it to be 80% veggies in there and maybe a, a, an apple or a pear in there just to sweeten it up. But definitely yeah. some of these juices or smoothies that you can buy, the Innocent brand, for example, that's mm-hmm. got like 56 grams of sugar in it, which is more than a Coca-Cola. So I think I sugar, my yeah, sugar's a big factor and it can be hard for people to kind of reduce their intake of or stop completely because of like the withdrawal symptoms and it's kind of like Mm. addictive substance so i think trying to move away from that sweet pleasure response in the in the taste buds once you kind of go without it for a while i know for myself personally eating even just a piece of fruit is just like unbelievable like unbelievably sweet and Mm. i don't crave any of the sugar or cakes that I used to and people always ask like oh do you not really want like a big piece of chocolate cake and some biscuits I'm like no not really because if I was to taste that I'd probably find it too sweet and I'd probably feel terrible after so it's just not worth it in my opinion Mm. got to get over that hump retrain the taste buds yeah so moving on to lifestyle factors now we touched on stress so why is stress management so important when it comes down to the fertility journey and maybe a couple trying to conceive what does what factor does stress play on the hormones in both male and females i think it plays a massive part on hormonal health i would say particularly for women um i think and this is something where i feel like the the kind of post 1950s backlash against your modern housewife and women being able to do everything men can do um has almost buggered our hormones to a certain perspective to a certain extent and that women can do everything a man can do i don't think that's true but i think we can do things differently and i think that's as empowering like why like you said like we're not just small men or if you're me and you're five foot ten, you're not. A man. Oh, same. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not small, but I'm equally still not a man. Yeah. Uh, and but how does it affect? So I think it affects women the more than men. I think in terms of fertility, uh, predominantly because the whole fertile feedback loop starts in the brain. And then the brain needs to signal to your ovaries to release that lovely egg. And if your stress levels are high, then that cortisol that's being made in your adrenals will favor that release of that egg, potentially. So that brain feedback loop has suddenly flicked like a little switch from going from your ovaries to actually going to your adrenals. And now that that road is being well trodden instead of the one to your ovaries. So I think women are much more impacted by stress than men as a massive generalization of gender. Like obviously there's varying degrees within that. Um, I think men can take on a lot more stress without it affecting their fertility. That's not to say it won't affect their heart or other aspects of the health, but I don't think it will see an instant effect on their sperm health. It might affect their ability to be able to get or keep an erection, which is very important for making a baby. But I don't know how much it would necessarily impact sperm health. I don't know. I don't think they've done a lot of research into it. Yeah, and I think when it comes to the female body in particular, like you say, it's really sensitive to stresses in the environment. And this is due to like an evolutionary development as humans so Mm. say back when we were cavemen our body would perceive threat in the environment and would kind of switch off hormones and reproductive function to protect our body and because we don't want a baby when we're either in a famine or running from a saber-toothed tiger so definitely hormone function ovulations delayed or missed completely that month and when it comes to periods, periods can vanish, they can be delayed, they can be longer, they can be extra PMS during yeah. the week before your cycle. So definitely when it comes to hormones as well, it can take 
three months for you to start to see the impacts of your diet and lifestyle. So if your period was really bad this month, I always recommend looking back to what was happening three months ago because that was the amount of time that it takes to uh, develop and release your egg. What do you think about the preconception window? How long do we need to prepare our bodies for a pregnancy? Can we come off the pill and just start trying already or would you recommend a longer period of time to really address some of these health issues that people might be struggling with? Well, I mean, you can come off the pill and start straight away and people do get pregnant. Um, and that is an option. And is it necessarily the best option? I don't, I don't know. Like who am I to say, but I would, what I would say is it takes roughly about 90 to hundred days for our eggs and sperm to mature. So well, for, for our eggs to mature and for sp- new sperm to be made. So you have got this three-month preconception window, if you like, to massively change the quality of your sperm and your eggs. Because when that sperm and egg meet, like that is DNA that is fixed and can't be changed. And you can massively impact how your DNA presents, essentially. So I don't I feel like it's a I am all kind of conflicted between saying like you must do this because this is yeah. genetics that yeah. will be made forever and you must but I think it's just being mindful that you have got a three month window where you can massively change things. And with my clients, I suppose my way of working is up front we do a, kind of a lot of that left brain thinking and do any tests that we need to get done we'll start to track the cycle we'll get a sperm analysis if it's not already been done and we'll do a lot of kind of the logical analytical find out exactly where they're at in terms of their fertility to give them a proper fertility MOT if you like but then once we've done that left brain thinking and we've put strategies in place and they've done that three month window it's almost then you then need to, I try and support my clients to then almost move away from that and not become fixated with ovulation dates and not become fixated on the exact time that I need to take my supplements. We need to then move away from that rigidity and move into that place of like growth and abundance and fruitfulness that I think the analytical left brain thinking can sometimes stunt. But I don't think is useful is when people say just relax it'll happen and it's like well you don't know what's going on Mm. like why like what's the point in saying that before you know what might be going on so I'd say like my approach to preconception would be a three-month window prior do the analytical bits that are really important can can ensure that you put your best foot forward and then you've almost got to you've got to let go and you've got to surrender with the knowledge that you've done all of that work or you've done all of that. And I mean, you've done all of that play because it doesn't work. I think sometimes got the connotation that it's going to be not necessarily enjoyable, but you're going to have done that fun stuff. And like, you know, getting your body into a fertile state, if it's done well, it shouldn't feel punitive. It should actually feel like it's empowering and yeah, a bit of a ramble but does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. That's, yeah, I think, yeah, I've got a really good perspective on that. And I remember we were talking about the maybe IVF process or a Mm. seminar that you was at and how clinical it is. And it wasn't encompassing all of the emotional and holistic approaches to the whole entire fertility journey. And definitely plays a massive role in emotional health, mental health, mindset even, do they actually believe that they can get pregnant is Mm. are they happy are they having fun in the life yeah and I'd say and I'd say fun and laughter are key and I see by the time people have come to me not always by any stretch but sometimes people are they you know it's been shit like they've not got this baby that they want they've seen everyone around them become full pregnant like you know they've just looked at a willy and they've become pregnant (laughs) and it's not and it's not happened to them and they're kind of like well you know they're not in a good place and I think I suppose what I think can be detrimental to mindset is like forced positivity or I think there's this whole camp of like 
we need to be positive. And I've had women say to me, like, maybe my IVF round didn't work last time because I wasn't positive enough. And I think we need to like, and I mean, I'm not a psychologist and I don't profess to be. We need to be careful about how, yeah, how we frame positivity. And because I think, yeah, sometimes women feel like they've not become pregnant because they're not positive enough. Or maybe it didn't implant because they weren't doing the right affirmations in the morning. Yeah. And that can be helpful in some cases, just getting that positive mindset and gratitude because of the hormones that are released from that, the dopamine, the oxytocin, that's yeah. going to benefit the body rather than being in that stress negative space. But then again, yeah. it's not the magic pill. It's not the cure all. It's not going to make you get pregnant just because you're doing that. Obviously there's millions of women who have had children who are, are going through a rubbish time, but it can be helpful in the fact that it's going to help your body more than being negative if that makes sense yeah yeah and I think it's it it's it's changing that and I think gratitude is something different from being positive like gratitude is acknowledging what you have got it's almost that stoic way of looking at life of let's just look at everything that I have got rather than what I haven't got which is slightly different in my mind to like let's try and be positive So, Rosie, we're coming to the end of the interview now. I want to thank you so much for your time, but I want to leave with just a a few quick questions just so the people listening can get to know you a bit better. So the first one would be, what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Because I know that breakfast is a meal that a lot of my clients struggle with. I don't know if it's the same with Mm. people you work with, but they're not quite sure what they can have to replace the cereal or the toast. So what did you have this morning? And obviously everyone's different, but just to give them a few ideas. So this morning I actually had a, not a traditional breakfast food because I actually had some soup. Um, it was actually a courgette and cauliflower soup. Uh, it was very nice. Um, with some nature, nature's own bread, I think it's called um i'll send you a link to put on the notes yeah. if you like yeah because it's it's essentially a a really nice naturally gluten-free bread made with it's got some oats it's got some psyllium husk um chia seeds and flax seeds and things like that which really nice. nice but yeah i had soup this morning but my usual breakfast would be eggs of some sort of variety yeah so it's not the bread filled with preservatives and fillers and no um white rice and things like that now <laughs> no it's a really nice one which <laughs> one of my clients found oh, they, were right. like, Rosie, they were like instead of making my own bread with the recipe you've sent because that seems like effort yeah how about this bread in waitrose and i was oh, like lovely. i was like oh oh well, yeah that looks great go with that and what's your morning routine like because it said that people with successful businesses and happy, healthy lives have a really strong morning routine. And for some people, it's not the case. But I'm just wondering, do you have a morning routine? So my morning routine is, so I'd get up, I'd have lemon water and my morning supplements. Then I, I like to go to the gym in the morning. So if I'm going to the gym or exercise, or maybe playing a game of squash, I'd try and do that in the morning, just because I find that if I do it later in the day, I don't sleep um, that well. So that's my normal morning routine, but I try and I used to always get up at 6am, and now I'm getting up at 7. I'm Ooh. like, <laughs> no, look at me, I'm like, oh, well, it's dark outside, and I think, yeah, I'm trying to value my sleep more. My yeah, morning do you know routine what? is actually an extra hour in bed. I'm the, I've been the exact same over the past couple Have of months. You? Yeah, in the summer I'm fine. I'm wide awake. I've mm. got tons of energy from the get go. But mm. yeah, over the past, I thought it was just me. But over the past few months, yeah, I've definitely needed an extra half an hour or an hour in bed, and mm. I still feel tired in the morning. So I mm. think I'm definitely more energetic because of the sunlight. And we've already discussed the benefits of circadian rhythm and getting mm. that morning light in. So it just shows that it definitely can have a massive impact on our health, not just from the vitamin D aspect, but also from 
the serotonin release and the just that sunlight mm. hitting our eyes and I want to ask you what is there one herb, food, or nutrient that you just can't live without? So if you were stranded on a desert island, what would be the one thing that you'd have to have with you? I would. I, it wouldn't be very portable, um, but eggs, for me, are they are the real superfood. Oh. I know when I've, I've done a lot of different protocols and ways of eating to try and see what experiences my clients would go through, including being vegan for a short amount of time for a couple of months and oh my god I craved eggs I love eggs they're such a good source of protein they've got all of the amino acids and you can get really good quality eggs for relatively little money so I think eggs have eggs every day yeah I wasn't expecting that one people would expect like magnesium or ashwagandha <laughs> but yeah I love that yeah, Egg. like, eggs give me eggs <laughs> And yeah. finally, just as a takeaway from this episode, what would be the one piece of advice that you'd give to someone who's struggling either with their hormones or with infertility or fertility challenges at this moment in time? I'd say definitely start with tracking your cycle and doing your temperature is a first port of call of understanding your body. Um, yeah would be start yeah that kind of fam start you need to really understand what's going on in your body and then the next steps would be changing it good yeah that's a really good really important piece that is commonly missed people are doing all the other things right but they're not actually they don't actually know when they're ovulating they don't mm. the the time in intercourse at the wrong time in the month as well mm. so i think getting in tune with your body and really understanding the signals and the messages from your body is yeah just crucial lastly can you just let people know where they can find you online and how to get in touch with you so i uh so i'm on instagram and facebook and i am under the is it a widget what do you call it a handle a handle yes, yes handle <laughs> handle rosy life uk but I'm like bloody grandma. Is this is a widget. Is it? What do you call these things? A widget? A handle? Uh, yeah, Rosy Life UK. And my website is www.rosylife.org. And then my telephone number and email address is all on there, as well as lots more information um, about me and how I work as well. Amazing. So I want to thank you so much for your time today. Definitely really useful information that you've shared and i really hope everyone listening has found value in what you've said so thank you for your time and i'm hoping that we can collaborate again in the future i'm sure you'll be back on the podcast and we can talk more things about fertility because the, the subject is just never ending well i've loved it i've loved my time great thank, thank you, you. Rosie. thank you for listening to another episode of the hormones in harmony podcast if you like this episode, please leave me a rating and review as this helps to spread the word to other women dealing with hormone imbalances. If you haven't already, check out my website vivanaturalhealth.co.uk and Instagram page at vivanaturalhealth for tons more free content and inspiration. You can also schedule a free 30-minute hormone troubleshooting call to find out the next steps to take in order to overcome your symptoms naturally. See you back here next week for another episode.